Hey everyone and welcome to today's event. Before we begin, let me tell you a bit about Expressia. We at Expressia are a team of people passionate about helping others create better experiences. With our online platform, you can build data-rich customer dream apps and make your personas come alive. And do that all together with your teammates in real time. We've also got a consulting team that conducts public and corporate workshops on all things journey mapping and interviews, as well as Expressia Academy with its interactive courses. And our free community events, just like this one. Today, we'll be talking about the future of CX. And no, we won't be reading the tea leaves. Instead, we'll take a high-resolution look at the future of CX and share some tips you can use to design, build, and introduce game-changing future state business strategies using CX. And our today's expert is an advisor, award-winning speaker, and experienced designer who has helped many leaders get their thinking unstuck so that their ideas can become real. The rest I will leave to him. So without further ado, welcome everyone, founder of StoryMiners, Mike Wittenstein. Hi everyone, it's great to be with you and thanks so much, Julia and Yuri, for having me. So before we look forward, what I wanted to do is take a look back. The world of customer experience is about 20 years old, but actually it had some roots back in the early 1900s. The picture on the left-hand side of an old guy with a beard and a black and white picture is R.H. Macy. He was the founder of Macy's Department Store. They were one of the first retailers to apply lots of customer experience design techniques. If you go back into history, especially his business history, you'll find that he was wonderful at voice of the customer, at service design, at operating efficiencies, and at doing things for the customer in balance with doing things for shareholders. So he was one of the very first practitioners. The most popular and most well-known around the world, perhaps the most beloved, was Walt Disney. And you can see a small black and white picture of him with Mickey Mouse at one of his parks back in the 1950s. Disney was one of the first to bring customer experience off the drawing board and into the real world with theme parks, movies, magazines, all kinds of different things. And the picture at the bottom is an agent familiarization tour. In the travel business, it's, it was very well known that if you were a travel agent trying to help people plan their vacations, that you had to go and have the experience for yourself. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to relate it to others. So while the techniques have been known for the longest amount of time, customer experience as a discipline didn't get really popular until the 1980s, 1990s, when some of the academics started working on turning it into a thing. So one of my favorite people from that time period is Jochen Wurtz, uh, and he's still very active in the business, um, a real seminal guy in terms of um, helping people understand the underpinnings of customer experience. The invention of customer experience, the way most of us think about it, was in 1999 when Joe Pine and his partner introduced the experience economy based on the notion that all the world is a stage. And Lou Carbone, an advertising guy, wrote the book called Clued In, which talked about the science behind customer experience. The Design Management Institute, a wonderful organization, uh, was also big on picking up and, and fueling a lot of support for customer experience. In the 2010 period, a lot of tool companies came into play. Confirmant, Medallia, later Uxpressia, and others that had specialized tools. And from 2000 on, what's been happening is we've been using customer experience, and this is where my heart gets a little bit sad. We've been using it more for repair and profit and for sales. You know, a lot of people that hire you into your roles or that want to do projects with you as a consultant are saying, yeah, let's do that customer experience stuff because I want you to fix this or I want you to improve my profit or I need to sell more. They're using customer experience as a tool to just improve their day-to-day -day operations. And I don't think that's the biggest and best use, which is why we're thinking about a new way to look at customer experience. There is a totally different way to look at all the tools that we have and the way we go forward. And basically, it's not so much about looking at things from yesterday or even today. It's about using customer experience design and customer-centered thinking in terms of moving the entire organization forward. 
So we're not looking at fixing the cash wrap or uh, doing buy online, pick up in store or delivering food to the door or sending people into others' homes with apps to measure their cabinets and things like that. Those are today things. Customer experience can also be used to set the strategy for an entire firm or even a business ecosystem. So the future of customer experience, as we talked about in the title, is well the future. So what I want each of you to think about is how can you use what you know today and twist it a little bit so that you can help people see a clearer way forward. Right now, we've had so many changes in the world. Customer bases have changed due to COVID, unfortunately. A lot of their preferences and needs have changed. The way we compete, the way we market, advertise, deal with clients, the way we get goods and services on the B2B side or on the B2B side have all been shaken up. So everybody is figuring out what's new. Everybody, including the businesses that you work for, whether you're working for a platform company or a something as a service company, or you're in hard lines or manufacturing or a very old industry like making bricks, everything is changing. And leaders at your organizations need tools to help them figure out what the future is going to be and to get everybody on board with it. So I'd like to show you how you can use customer experience design, a lot of the tools that you're familiar with, like journey maps, to prototype the future. When I talk about prototyping, a lot of people's minds go to, oh yeah, I've, I've got this really cool um, thing. I've got a pair of glasses and I wanna prototype it. I wanna make it better. I wanna change the length of this part, or I wanna change the curve here, or I wanna change the color here. And that's all great. And you know what? When we're working at the scale of an entire enterprise, we just don't do that so much. And we probably should, because there's an expression, the devil is in the details. And that means when you actually try your really cool ideas out in the real world, you get a lot of resistance. You fail a whole bunch of times. But it's not personal failure, it's just you tweaking the design and making it ever better. So here are a few specific things that you can do with the customer experience design tools that you already have, just twist it a little bit so that you can start to get some different results with folks. So here's an example of how we can go from numbers to design. On the left-hand side of the screen, there is a, um, a chart that shows a whole bunch of numbers. It represents a company's strategy. It might be about, you can, you can change the graphs for whatever you want. It might be about strategy, speed, efficiency, not running out of a product, making sure that the dentist office is clean. So many of us have been trained to think by the numbers and especially those who hire us and those who pay us are used to thinking by the numbers. So they want customer experience to achieve these results. And you know what? If it were 10 years ago, that would be okay. But in my opinion, it's not okay now because we're all looking forward to a very different future. The world has changed. The way the world works has changed. What people want, is whether they're customers or employees has changed. So we can't just declare new numbers as leaders Leaders are now responsible, in my opinion, for providing more detail about how the future is going to work, how it's going to look, how it's going to make customers feel. I hope that makes sense. On the top right hand side, you'll see a, a, a sketchy picture with a, a greeter that's an employee of a store. He's the man facing a woman. And this is the encounter of the woman entering the store. And you might say, okay, the woman's gonna enter the store. But there's a lot that goes on in that moment. That's a really important moment in the entire customer experience of that woman's visit to go shopping. You'll notice some blue dots. Each one of those blue dots defines an action. It defines a clue. It defines an, inform an information flow. Basically, it's the nuts and bolts of how that experience is going to get delivered. I don't even know if I can read those because the, the type is so small, 
but one of them says the there's a uniformed representative. So that's a clue for the business that it has to have uniforms for everyone that everybody needs to wear them. So the people who make uniforms and do branding are going to be working on that. And they know that they're trying to get that to fit into the front of store welcoming experience. You'll also notice that the rep is holding a tablet computer. Well, the IT department's going to have to make sure that tablet computer can move around and do what it needs to, but also secure it so that it can't be hacked and that it won't leave the premises because those are nice and people might just take them. You'll also notice that there's a rack of tablet computers right behind the sales rep. When the store gets busy, the idea is to give each customer their own tablet and let them walk around and do some self-service. All right, you're starting to get the picture. By putting more details into the picture, it starts to become a little bit more real. So that's an example of how you can show a moment from the future and let everybody dissect it in their mind's eye, in their imagination, so they can see what it's like, feel what it's like to be part of that experience. Then what they do is they start evaluating based on what could be, as opposed to just looking at the numbers about, you know, they don't know if that's going to happen or not. They just know it's going to be a lot of pressure and they're facing an uncertain future because they don't know how to get there. All right, take a look at the bottom right. This is one of the exhibits or interactive kiosks inside of the same store. But notice how we've added some color to it. And notice how the focus is on the user's faces. You can see that there's a large screen that they're looking at and they're learning about how the product in this store works. It happens to be glasses, by the way, which is why I use these. Um, glasses that get dark when they hit ultraviolet light, you know, that like automatic sunglasses without having to own a second pair, they're made by transitions. And that's what they're getting right now is the transitions experience. So the point of this particular image is that the customer experience is first and foremost. Look at the emotion that you can see on people's eyes. Oh, grandma says, that looks really cool. Dad's trying them on and getting the transitions experience and the kid's smiling. Can I try, can I try? That's so different than what you see on the left-hand side of the screen. Go look at the green lines and the red lines. Look at the ruler, look at the graph at the bottom, look at the stacked bar chart. That doesn't give you any emotion. That doesn't give you any feeling. That doesn't give you any sense of the aesthetic or how that experience is going to be. I hope you're starting to see a little bit of a difference that pictures and storyboards can drive more interest, intrigue, and more specific followership. Let's take a look at another one. It's so often for leaders to communicate their strategy about the future using organization charts. Well, organization charts are great, but they only represent a pivot. And a pivot is when you make a change and you do things in a new way. The problem, in my opinion, with so many pivots is that they cost so much money, take so much effort, and hurt so many people individually and their careers. They're efficient from a spreadsheet perspective in theory, but a lot of them don't work as well as they're supposed to. And there are not too many measures about how poorly they did work. So the idea that you should pivot is still first and foremost in perhaps your leader's minds. A different way to look at that pivot is to introduce the idea of being adaptive into an organization as a new and permanent capability so that the organization doesn't have to go through these cycles of large pivots. It can just make a series of small changes as it grows and adjusts to changing customer needs. It's the same idea behind like a minimum viable product. You keep developing the product. You never stop as a matter of fact. So two things that we use to define the customer experience of the future are a reason for being and a promise map. Take a look at the top right of your screen. The, the reason for being is a statement of your brands and your company's DNA. In essence, it's the biggest promise that your company can make, that your brand can make, but that your company can keep. It's not worth it to say, we're going to be amazing, and then to offer a lackluster or a medium quality experience. So for this transition store, 
the reason for being was to astound, just boom, blow the minds of people who wore glasses and those who didn't to the extent that they would tell their friends. And in my opinion, that was a brilliant reason for being because the, the purpose of the entire store was to make people who wore glasses and didn't go, whoa, when they saw how the light hit their eye. And that meant that the transitions experience had to work for people who didn't wear glasses. They would become some of the greatest advocates of the product. On the bottom right is a picture of a promise map. A promise map shows who owes what to whom in a business. Unlike an org chart, it doesn't say who reports to who, it shows how work gets done. If you're a fan of Clayton Christensen, um, he wrote The Innovator's um, Dilemma and The Innovator's Solution, I think was the name of the other book. He also, before he passed away a few years ago, wrote about jobs to be done. And he said that organizations should be organized around the work that they do for their clients because when they create value for their clients, that's when they earn a profit. So this picture was done by Walt Disney in 1957, long time ago, 40, 64 years ago. That's, that's a whole generation and a half. And if you look at it closely, you can see how each part of the company owes an outcome to another part of the company. For example, comic books drove book sales book sales drove movie sales, movie sales drove visits to the theme parks, and so on and so on. And that map made it super clear who owes what to whom. Giving that level of detail as part of an experience of the future makes everybody understand. And more than that, it makes them want to lean in and understand even more. So here's one more. And this is one of my favorites. On the left, you see a process chart. It, it doesn't matter what it is, it's a piece of stock art. But on the top right, what we did is we turned a process into a story. This story was for a consulting firm that was undergoing some rapid growth and evaluating whether they wanted to buy or build a professional services automation package, you know, like QuickBooks Online for their, for their business to run their consulting projects. So we created a fictitious character named Lindsay, and her, her job in this story was to go to work and go through about four years of her career in about 15 pages. But you know what? Oh my gosh, she fell and she broke her leg, which means she couldn't go to work. Good thing the company had invested in this new software because she didn't have to go to the office to get her work done. And it was through the things that happened to Lindsay that we were able to explain the benefits of a software as a solution kind of a thing. On the bottom right, we've um, hired this guy, Jorn Nielsen, a few times. He's a little bit close to you guys in Copenhagen, Denmark. He's one of my favorite animators to work with. He worked, used to work for Disney. Um, and we've developed a relationship where he can draw in ex the experience that he hears as we're having the conversation. We call this process, see what you say. As people start talking about their idea for the future experience, this one's for a car leasing company called Lease Plan. He's sketching out things in order and bringing in emotions, activities, clues, props, technology, and all of that. It's not just words on a page like some graphic recorders do. This is true storyboarding. And here's the magic, and here's why it works for future, story, future stories of customer experience. As soon as people start to see in their mind's eye and on the page what they're talking about, their attention moves from this is what I'm thinking to, oh, this is what we're thinking. The resistance that they might have to others' ideas just dissipates, it disappears, and they all start working on what can they do together? And how can this be better for customers? So these are a few different ways that you can kind of see what the future state customer experience is. So you might be asking yourself, how can you use this to drive the business strategy of an entire organization using customer experience? Anybody have any ideas? You want to pop them in the chat real quick? 
By the way, I'm a five second guy. If I don't see anything in five seconds, we're gonna move on. So one. All right, I didn't see anything. Did you guys see anything? Nope, all right, let's keep going. Um, if, if you're doing this job, how can you actually talk, have a conversation with your boss, with your leadership team about using customer experience design as a business strategy? So that's the question. The first thing that you need to know is that unlike customer experience design, which is down here used for profit and repair and for sales, the most valuable thing the company has going on right now is its future. 90 plus percent of executives, and this was a US and a global study have agreed that leaders are focused on strategy more than they have been in a decade. About 90 plus percent of folks list strategy in their top few items of where they're putting their executive attention. They need to figure out the future. They need to figure it out fast. And the hardest thing for them is to get people to buy in to get people to understand, to get people to give them the freedom of expression, the, the you know to not cast a doubt on things too early and to give things a try. Executives can't move forward without the followership of their people. So I'm gonna give you in a couple of slides, just two little techniques that you can do right now that makes a difference. So here's the first one. You start by declaring your intent. You have to let your leadership team know that this customer experience stuff that you've been investing in, and by the way, thank you for my job, you can tell them, can move beyond repair and profitability into value creation for clients. That is where all the movement is right now. The brands that are delivering more value for clients as clients measure it, not as companies measure it, are the ones that are skyrocketing and doing well. The ones that have converted their restaurants to ghost kitchens or doing drive throughs at the crazy American restaurants where everybody eats in their car. You can also use customer experience design to get your entire ecosystem on the same page. If you need an example of that, Apple Computer might be the very best one. When they launched the iPhone about 11 years ago in 2010, they got AT&T, all their technology suppliers, and even the record industry all on the same page so they could launch that one device. They all made changes to the way they worked, how they communicated, what they prioritized, and how they made things fit together so they could introduce the iPhone. That's ecosystem design. All right. So the advantage that you can talk to your bosses about for future state customer experience design is that you can bring all the different parts of your business together in alignment. Remember the story that we did, you know, for transitions where I showed you the, the drawing with the little dots on it and it showed clues from technology, clues from uniform, clues from store design and so on. It's the same thing here. All the things around that circle from human resources to process to learning, they can all come into alignment because you're telling stories about what the life of the employees will be like. When you make your employees the hero of a story, and a story is nothing more than a little bit, you know, it's a, it's a, re, a recanting, a retelling of the experience. So you design the experience, and then you tell a story about it. And that's what helps them to win alignment. Here's the trick, maybe the most important slide of the entire deck. Ready? What you're looking at is an animation. Uh, I don't know who did it. I found it on Google, but it looks like Scar from The Lion King. He was, he was the bad uncle lion, the evil guy. And you can see that he's in one position over here, but in the third frame, he's in a totally different position. That's called a keyframe. When you're building an animation, it's very much like building the future state of a business. It's up to the design team to figure out, I'll use my hand here as an example. So here's a keyframe and here's a keyframe. So all you have to do is show the most important moments in your experience. Like when Lindsay broke her leg, that forced people to think about the importance of that automation software. 
if you're doing something with culture or sales or buy online, ship to store, whatever it is, you show those moments where things are really important here and here. And then what you do is you let your team figure out all the different steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. They have the guidance of doing this. So they're going to fill it in so that they end up over here. But you give them the pen. You give them the right to author some of the experience. There's no way a leader can figure all of that out in their own head. They need the whole team. So if you've given them a few keyframes, they know where the animation, they know where the story is going to go. And it's up to them to stay on story, to stay in the story, and to fill out their part as they move along. I hope that's making sense. Yuri, I can see your face. Give me a smile if that's working. Okay. The other thing that you can do if you're, if you're taking this to an even bigger level and you're getting more value out of your customer experience is to use customer experience design techniques with your partners and your suppliers. There, you're getting bigger parts of the business like the supply chain it depends on, some of the technology that it uses, handoffs between different companies. It's exactly the same thing. And when people hear stories, they're going to respond better because they're going to be part of the story. They're going to bring their creativity, their imagination, and they're going to figure out how their pieces can fit in that coordinated whole. All right. So th that's, that's the deal. You use the same customer experience design tools you've been using. You bring them to life by sharing stories about them, by putting people in as the hero, and then by giving the responsibility of finishing the story to the people that you're working with, because that's what wins buy-in. And going back to the very beginning of the presentation, leaders are struggling with strategy and they know they can't do it alone. They can't move unless everybody moves with them. And that's where the buy-in comes from. So I put to you that customer experience is the new language of leadership. Mike, uh, thank you so much for shedding some light on what the future actually holds for CX. Uh, that was a great overview, and I'm sure that now we will have more things to talk about here. Um, everyone, we've got Yuri here, founder of Expressia, and Yuri, how do you find Mike's, Mike's talk? Do you have any questions, maybe? I do, I do. I mean, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I have a bunch of questions here. So, uh, Mike, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. And I, uh, personally, I really love the, the, the was a whether well, there are two secrets or one secret. Okay, so let it be the first secret that you shared with uh, with this. I personally, for myself, I call it um, snapshots. So it's like showing a snapshot, but I, I'll get to that one a little bit later. So uh, I wanna ask you um, the same question that we ask our audience at the beginning, uh, but I wanna hear your take on it. Uh, so the future of CX, uh, what what is your take? Uh, on it. So I, have, I have two answers. The first one is the future of CX as a discipline, as a profession, is to work more on the future of the enterprise. I really think it's going to go in that direction. The other thing I think that needs to pervade or in kind of get inside the community is the idea of using customer experience to create more value for clients and customers. Right now, in my opinion, it's being used overused to deliver value to the enterprise. And I think that because we're in such a period of change and transformation, if companies would use their customer experience skills and tools to first create more value for their clients and customers and partners and employees, mm -hmm. then they will get better returns to the shareholders. So we need a big mind shift right here. The corporate board has agreed in principle and a lot of the companies of the 350 that are represented are moving in the direction of away from shareholder primacy for corporations, large companies, government enterprises, et cetera, to take responsibility for their ecosystems, not just for the folks who own shares of stock. So I hope 
that customer experience will be used to create more value for customers by giving them not only a seat at the table and in the research, but by putting them right into the future designs. Hmm. Okay, so my um, my take on it was not so so global, <laughs> since I'm 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 looking at the at the, at the world through. Um, through my business as well. And uh, since uh, uh, our business is about journey mapping, uh, so my take here would be that uh, journey maps, uh, you know, they're uh, spreading across different industries from what I see and turning not just in uh, customer journey maps, but employee journey maps, student journey maps, uh, citizen journey maps. And, and so on and so forth. I've even seen uh, when they try to uh, apply the same technique to things like plastic journey map, just to show the story of a plastic uh, yeah. and to raise the awareness. So uh, that's uh, one thing. Another thing is that what I'm seeing is um, a lot of uh, marketing and sales are also uh, trying these things and trying to turn, for example, their um, uh, marketing funnels into journey maps or something like that. So that's what I see through the lens of uh, of the business we are in. And uh, yeah, I hope it will spread more. Actually, I do too. You know what you what you're talking about in in words that I would use um, are sharing the same story from different points of view. You know, the student this the plastic that, you know, the electron is jumping from this database to that database, the pizza is, is forming in this oven and being delivered in that box. The more points of view you can share from the same story, the more everybody can kind of align and get on the same page. I think that's absolutely awesome. Can I share something about the future with you that might might go, that's, that's too global, but you might go, hmm, maybe that's something I could do with you, Expressia. Okay, so I'm uh, sure, sure, please do, because I, I did have another question about the journey maps, but yeah, let's uh, let's go right. with uh, with your so, vision first. All right. Well, it's not my vision. Um, there's a, a French manufacturing company called Dassault Systems, D A S S A U L T, I think, and what they've done is um, created digital twins of the manufacturing process. So if there's a factory line that, that makes something, they'll create mm -hmm. a digital version of it, and then. What they'll do is they'll put digital people in front of it and they'll have the digital people doing, you know, whatever it takes to make the product. And they're measuring the stress on the shoulder and then they're adjusting the height of the table so that people and don't get muscle. Digital problems. shoulders? Well, yeah, they use the digital shoulder of the person, but it's based on okay. real human measurement. So okay. they're checking for stress well, on the system um, so that people don't feel bad. I think the idea of modeling experiences, especially with all the VR that we have coming online now and all the smart technologies and the sensors, tr a trillion sensors coming online soon, that we're gonna be able to do a lot more of that. So I think what we're gonna be seeing is more real-time customer journey mapping and we'll see all kinds of new uses for your tool. So I'm very excited for you Expressia's future. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And that reminds me of the movie, uh, uh, I think the, the title was uh, The Founder about the McDonald's story. Yeah. Uh, when, yeah. yeah when, when they actually prototyped. Uh, yeah. And I know that's a, a kind of a professional deformation. Yeah. For me, but I saw, yes, that's interaction design. Woohoo. Exactly. Yeah. That's, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. almost the uh, same thing that you mentioned right now, but happened a dozen of years ago. Uh, yeah. So speaking about uh, journey maps, and you mentioned that several times. Uh, so uh, how how exactly, if you know that, uh, tools like journey maps can help us to uh, to envision, you know, uh, the future to to you know to to work with the future. Do you know so any implications? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think there are two things that come to mind. The first one is human. Let's tackle that one first. Remind me that there's another one. Um, one of the hardest things for organizations to do is make a statement about the future. 
They're mm -hmm. afraid to say, this is what I think it could be. They, they plant a flag and stand by it and let everybody look at the flag and claim that territory. So often people in corporations have been trained or large organizations, they're forced to find the data that supports their assumptions. Mm -hmm. The most important thing about a journey map is looking at a plain blank white sheet of paper, you know, whether it's a blank screen or a piece of paper that you're actually working on because it makes you use your brain and your heart and your own experiences to postulate or to just put down something that might be appropriate for the future. There is no regression analysis. There is no chart. There is no Pareto curve. There is no best practice that can tell you where to go in the future. It just doesn't work that way. If you're trying to improve the, the, the number of ball bearings, you know, those little things that, that make parts avoid entropy, those little parts, if you're trying to go from 10,000 per hour to 10,100 per hour, you don't need a journey map for that. If you're trying to serve customers in a new way because they're not coming to your restaurant anymore and you need to go to them, you need to figure out something new. But everything your restaurant needed to, did in the past doesn't really inform where you're going. So I think one of the most important things for a journey map of the future is to just sit down and be comfortable with nothing to get started and to start to put your ideas down and to come up with a process for capturing lots of ideas, putting them down, expanding them, and then blending in some of the features and sharing it with customers. It's no different than you know minimum viable product thinking. Maybe we could call it minimum viable experience thinking. So I see that journey maps are a way for teams to collaborate from across the organization or in larger ecosystems to put all their ideas down and share them. It doesn't have to be um, always linear. You know, a lot of the journey maps are linear. So as, as we start to see more robust yep. technologies, more AI applied to it, more, more 3D-ness, we'll be able to get more views at the same time on the same map. So. That's what I think. That's true. That's true. I mean, the, um, uh, the, the life itself uh, is more uh, complicated uh, than just a linear journey map. That's for sure. Uh, but um, I wanted to uh, point on that mm, white, uh, so what, what you mentioned, sitting in front of the white uh, blank journey map. Yeah. So that's actually one of the questions uh, that I have also. So speaking about these snapshots uh, or that twinning, uh, did I get the right? Yeah, okay. So where can I actually get it? I mean, where can I get this snapshot as the, as the okay. founder okay. or as a product manager or whoever else is thinking um, right. about the future? Really yeah. All right, so here's, here's, I'll give you an example. Um, a friend of mine, Diane Majors, um, who's been popular with the Customer Experience Professionals Association. She's a, a, an internal consultant. She's been a chief experience officer. She shared on stage in Atlanta at CX Talks a few years ago, this idea that the best experiences are kind of coming together to deliver even better experiences. Her example was on one app, you can push a button and you can have a Starbucks delivered by an Uber driver anywhere you happen to be. One button. So think about that. That's, that's okay, that's, that's stupid. Who needs that, right? We, we live in a world where there's so much need and there's poverty and disease and COVID. This is, a, this is ridiculous stuff. But just think about it for a second from an experience design perspective. If you're looking for the key frame to put down so that you can start to map your experience of the future, it doesn't always have to be the part that the customer sees. It can be the hardest parts because those are the ones that you're going to need support for. You got to jump over those hurdles to get support. So the hardest part of that whole app is, in my opinion, might be balancing out the timing. So the app itself has to know where the, where the customer is. They have to know where the nearest Starbucks is where the nearest driver is, and they have to tell the driver when to go to Starbucks based on traffic and distance, and they have to tell Starbucks when to start making the order based on knowing how long it takes, 
how long the line is or what the pickup is in the store so that the customer can get it the fastest and the hottest. So if you create the screen that shows all of those things with one, you know, what's behind that one click, that forces everybody to look at the hardest part first, and then they can figure out their details. And that usually works because once people get that first big problem solved, they feel confident and they start doing the little ones and every th everything starts lining up. So find the thing that's the most impossible and make it possible. Just take off the I am, impossible to possible, and you're all good. Um, changing EM in impossible might be like, I am possible. <laughs> you're very good with words. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so one, one more question from me, and I think that will um, uh, somehow uh, resonate with one of the questions that I already seen in uh, in the chat is uh, uh, so there are tools that business uh, business use uh, such as uh, mission vision and and strategy and I, I call them like a tool a tool to maybe to synchronize the company maybe to uh, yeah so and uh, what do you think uh, how about people that are uh, I hope actually now here with us and we're wor working the CX uh, field. So we have different tools. Um, and I'm curious about is how these two can work together. I mean, how people who are playing uh, CX or even UX role, maybe head of CX, how they can use their own tools and to align them with... Uh, mission, vision, and strategy, all that stuff. Okay. You know, I'm going to give you a very harsh answer. <laughs> More than half the time, that's not possible because the mission and the vision suck. <laughs> okay. They're just, they're just nice words that people put down. They have too much beer, not enough time, and they say something nice. Like, we're going to be the best uh, combine manufacturer. Combine is a farming equipment. We're going to be the best tractor um, builder uh, in the east part of our country. Well, what does that mean? It's not a promise. It's, it's just internally focused. So let's, let's focus on the parts where um, a company is using a reason for being, not just a vision or a mission. You know, a vision is like defined as something that you can't attain. Yeah, everybody says, oh yeah, the vision that we're trying for, but nobody expects to get there. In my opinion, that's stupid. I think you should make the biggest, boldest promise that you can keep. That's where the focus should be. Anything less isn't worth doing. And why would you waste your time on doing something that's never going to happen? The, the mission vision part, you, sometimes it's impossible to align the customer experience to the mission and the vision. It's hard work, but if you can adapt that mission and vision into, call it the same thing if you want to, but make it a reason for being, make it real, make it what customers want most and what the company does best. That's the right place to play. And you want that to be aspirational, something that requires you a little bit of extra effort to attain because it also makes it harder for your competition to attain. But once you do it, you can infinitely adapt your experience so that you're always delivering what customers want most and you're always doing it in a new delightful way so once you make that shift you're able to become an evergreen brand okay so my my take here is for sure not uh not about the missions and uh, visions and uh, strategies that uh, that you call like real bullshit, but those that uh, really mean what they what they are. Like people uh, really want to 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 go there. Uh, let's say mission. If mission is the reason why company exists, and that was defined by a, by, by a team. And uh, the vision is the place where they would like to go, and strategy is the is the way they're going. Then, for me, uh, based on these um, 
three things, you can start defining things like goals, uh, like year goal, annual goals. And, and based on that, you can go into OKRs, let's say. And here goes the, the bridge between <laughs> my question here and the question of, um, Yuli, if, if you can help me. It's Bruno. Find... Bruno, Bruno, yeah. Yeah, so uh, let's maybe go to, to that one because I think that that's really important because here uh, where, where goes the, the, the bridge between uh, things like vision, mission, um, strategy, and things uh, that we face in our daily life from in our daily activities what what we do you know this week next week this month so yeah uh the the, the question that Bruno asked was uh he said that uh, he works in a startup as a product and service designer uh and here we, uh, they adopted the okr framework so the question is how can I relate CX to OKRs if numbers are no more than important. I'm facing a challenge that every design initiate the C-level asked me to relate to OKR. Okay, define OKR for me. Make sure we're using the same definition. Yeah, it's- um, Objectives it's and key. And key, yeah. okay. Results. All right, so in my opinion, and in some of my practice over the last few years, we've had to augment the OKRs to include a fair balance of customer facing metrics. A lot of OKRs are all about how many hamburgers did we sell? How many French fries did we sell? How much money did we get every hour in the restaurant? Well, mm -hmm. what about customer value oriented things? Like how many orders were delivered properly? How many orders were delivered on time? How many custom orders could we accommodate in an hour? How many employees were we able to give a break to? See the difference? So often the OKRs are all about the company. If you add OKRs that are about the customer, it makes it easier for everyone to create better balances and set better priorities. It's when you skew too far to one side, either the customer side or the business side, that the other side hurts. And that's not what helps a brand to thrive because you can't make bigger, better promises and keep them if you're only doing it for one side. It's a, it's definitely an us, not a me thing. Mm. I, I, I can only uh, add here that um, just on top of my head, there are at least few things that uh, we can measure on a uh, QR level, like how many interviews, uh, let's say, are we uh, doing? Uh, and we can try to quantify the, let's say, the research, not only interviews, but uh, it might be like surveys or um, whatever else. Or yeah, yeah, I know there is a controversial topic about NPS, but it might be also NPS for it that we are trying to influence. And yes, I, I, I know that that might be more on the customer success side, but still. So there are metrics that uh, metrics and KRs that uh, I think we can use as, as uh, CX or UX professionals here. But I let uh, Yulia to uh, maybe move forward with, with another question from the audience. Okay, Yuri, thank you so much. Great questions. I see that the audience as well enjoy the conversation. So thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, all right, and we actually do have a couple of questions for the Q&A if you still haven't dropped yours in the chat. I'm a bit more merciful than Mike, so I will wait for more than five seconds. <laughs> but <laughs> we have a question from Ashish here. The question goes, uh, how do we define the future state based on CX when market is extremely regulated, customer expectations are not much clear, and technology enabling the providers is still evolving? Yeah. You know, Ashish, um, maybe the best thing that you can do in a situation like that is provide some hope for all of the different members so that directionally they can start moving in the right way. I, I kind of liken that question to the work that the United Nations does, does. 
it's very complicated to get the interests of so many countries aligned. Even when we have pandemics, we have uh, an assassination of a president in Haiti this week, and on and on, everyone seems to have a different interest. So when progress actually starts to happen, it's when people rally around or they agree about a similar set of values. So my suggestion to you is to not expect that customer experience can be the problem solver. Problem solver. It will be individual peoples and personalities, leadership, management, communications. That's what's going to win the day in a situation like that. Customer experience is not the tool set that will get you that far. But to provide hope, to create some sense of what the values are of a complex situation like that, you can put little uh, examples of what the customer experience of the future might be. And you can give those to people as a taste. It's kind of like an appetizer before dinner. Or if you go to a wedding and people pass around some little bites of food for you to try while you're waiting for the bride to get dressed because brides are always late and uh, you're getting hungry. So think of it as a taste. And that might be a way for people to adopt your ideas and they become your ideas become their ideas. And once people's values are aligned, things can start to move a little bit more quickly. The three things that you mentioned about um, customers don't care, there's lots of regulation and the technology is not moving fast enough. Each one of those three is waiting on the other two. So think about using customer experience to set examples that can work for all three. The first thing that will happen is that people will see that there is a possibility for an answer that will work for all three. And the best place to start building those is with people from each of those groups. All right, Mike, thank you so much, Ashish. I hope that gives you a lot of insights to work on later. Uh, do we have any other questions? Feel free to put them in the chat. And Ashish, please feel free to share your uh, thoughts on that answer too. You might hate it and that's okay. All right, uh, Ashish here adds, let me be more precise in my previous question. How about insurance industry? How about the insurance industry? Tell me more. And if she's feel feel free to talk if you prefer. Yeah, sure. Just unmute yourself and. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, okay. Uh, see, insurance industry, especially in Asia Pacific, is pretty fragmented. Uh, the way customer behavior is. Uh, the the uh, if you look at uh, North American market, the ticket size is large. The volume are small. But in Asia Pacific, it's the other way around. The ticket sizes are small, the volumes are very high, and it's scattered. Customer behavior is tough to understand. Uh, the product innovation is very, very dismal, I'll say, right? Technology uptake is very poor because insurance company doesn't have a strong balance sheet to invest in uh, IT systems, right? Uh, and, and, and probably I'll say, uh, which you also know, the market is not at all differentiated. It's, it's heavily commoditized. I strongly feel customer experience is the only possible way out to differentiate yourself in the market, especially when it is not differentiated at all, right? Yeah. So th that's where my question was, because market is extremely regulated. Uh, insurance is one of the most regulatory intrusive inter industry in the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the expectation, as I said, like it is fragmented. Customers are price sensitive. Customers are value concerned, right? Uh, and and the uh, organizations are technocratically fundamentalist. A bit harsh. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with this situation when a person like me is pushed into you know, providing thoughts around how to create differentiation for the customer and and value for the organization? Yeah, it's yeah. not an easy situation. First, I want to acknowledge your, your bravery and your persistence and your patience for working in conditions like that. It's not easy. And I agree with you. Customer experience can be the differentiator, primarily because it doesn't have to cost anything and because people will notice. So when I run into situations like this, and I'm, I feel a pattern between this and some other businesses that I've worked in, I've only had a little bit of insurance, but I've done other similar businesses. It's important for you to work with the folks at the brand and the research 
and the learning or training areas of the company. Because you can't change the whole world's opinion of your company, but you can make a difference. And the way to start to do that is to work with your brand people to figure out what place on the, I guess, the lifetime of a customer continuum you want to make a difference. And in insurance, at least from my perspective here in the Atlanta, Georgia area on the East Coast of the Southern United States, you can either focus on making the best choice for your insurance, caring about the things that you're insuring, or making the claims process easy. Those are the parts that most people understand. Now, that's for consumer insurance. For business to business, it's very different. It's much more regulated, at least where I live. So if you're talking about, if you're talking with your brand folks, where do you have resources? Where do you have the most amount of information so that you can start to message a little bit differently? I would lean on the brand folks to say, all right, what kinds of things have you been trying to do that you haven't been able to do? Talk to the revenue people about what have you been trying to do that you haven't been able to do and put together some design thinking sessions based on what everyone's agenda is. The folks that you normally would fight with can become your best friends because everybody needs something. The whole machine is like locked and customer experience can be some like oil that kind of loosens things up and lets them work again. So in my opinion, the starting point is going to need to be with the brand deciding whether they want to make a claim up front and you focus on letting people make easier, better choices for themselves and their families, or it's going to be at the end, like, oh my gosh, what if you do have a claim? We're going to take care of you. And in, in our world over here, um, there are, there's a lots of competition all along that continuum. Did that help at all? Yeah, certainly it helps. It uh, gives me some insight into you know trying out or experimenting with uh, possibilities. Definitely, mm -hmm. thank you, thank you, Mike. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, do do try all three perhaps, and and see what people say. Let let the world tell you what they want, and just changing the posture of your company from from telling and doing and repeating and you know being a machine to listening a little bit can also loosen things up a bit. It does take a long time, though. So we're talking quarters and years, not days and weeks. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thanks, Ashish. OK, Ashish, thank you so much. And Mike, thank you as well. Uh, we have time for one more question. And I'm, I can't let you go before I ask it. So this one is from Laura here. Uh, Mike, lots of companies say that they want to be customer centric, but like you said, it's all about numbers in the end. If it's all about the details, how and where do you actually start? Do you keep it high level to capture everything, start to finish, or keep it small and tackle parts of the journey specifically? Hey, Laura, can you unmute and ask that question for me? I want to hear your voice when you ask it so I can get you a real specific answer. Sure. Um, I, I'm simply wondering where you start because everyone in, in different business functions are very siloed and they're focusing on their numbers and their, uh, their job specifically. So, you know, you have to roll this out and um, do you, do you keep okay. it high level or, Big, or medium or small company? Big. And we're talking right. probably global. <laughs> All right, let me, let me suggest a couple of things. I, I know you wanted to talk a little bit more, but I recognize a pattern. Let me share this answer and then we can do more if you like. Is that okay? Perfect. All right. So it's not like the best process is going to win because everybody's vested in their own process. Um, what I've seen work in the past, and I, I don't have thousands of yeses behind this, but what I've seen work is um, creating opportunities for people in different parts of the company to work together. So one form that may take is a field trip where everybody goes to visit with some customers, depending on your business, visit them in the house, see them in the store, walk around the hospital, those kinds of things. Another thing you can do is an exchange program where people from each department 
do the other department's jobs. So I'll go to accounting for a day, accounting will go to marketing, marketing will go to operations and so on. Those kinds of activities tend to create trust between people and give each person a view of what the other person's life is really like. It creates a little bit of empathy. It makes it easier for people to work together. And here's the deal behind it. It's all about design thinking. In my opinion, the best design thinking is done to solve multiple problems at the same time. It lets everybody get more of what they want. So um, if you believe that uh, and you have the opportunity to bring some of your team together in creative ways, that kind of opens the door for the conversations that you need to have. Because no matter who comes up with a better process, it's not likely to win. The people have to see that they're going to win by working together. Everything else can come after that. All right. How was that? And what else did you want to, we, we can go at it a different way if you like. Mike, I love that. And we actually, I just led a project about internal persona building and their journey. So we now all, all see what we we are all doing in our separate functions. So we are right along that, that path. Um, and so from your previous answers, I had a question on, um, you know, how, how do you approach these situations? Um, and because everyone's working in their silos, and you just said, you, you just kind of do it, you got to bring it together. It's a customer journey. That's, that's the center of everything. So um, from what you're telling me, I think you're saying, keep it small and bring it to everybody and have these discussions around specific parts of the journey so that they really appreciate those pieces and break it apart there um, and tackle the entire journey, seeing the big picture, but, but in pieces. So, so different functions really understand. Yep. And you could also start yes to all of that. And you could also start with something like you said, very small, you could look for where things break down or where you uh. can build things up. So I have everybody like help each other find the breakdown points by being like an over the shoulder consultant and just kind of looking. When you give people permission to ask a stranger for help, it creates a fabulous professional bond. And it also makes that person feel really good that they can see something that somebody else can't. If we all were to go to each other's closets, we could probably find better ways to organize things. You know what I mean? So- Love that, gives, absolutely. Yeah. There you go. So give, give them the opportunity to ask little questions of each other and then find some commonality. It can be a positive thing like the hero. It can be a negative thing like the, the, the villain, you know, or the, or the devil. You know, you can, you can rally against the bad or you can rally for the good. But let them kind of figure that out. Oh, one last thing, and this is for everyone as we're, I think we're kind of wrapping up here because we're, we went from 50 something to 30 something. So I guess we're, we're almost done. Um, um, I just lost my train of thought because I was talking too much. Hang on. Oh yeah, here it is. Experience design, in my opinion, at its core is about transforming people. When we go to the movies, we're paying to have our emotions transformed. When we spend way too much money on a wedding as a father, it's because we want to have a feeling, a memory. We want to we be seen in a certain way. Experiences are exactly the same thing. The power of story, and we're talking about future stories and the future state of customer experience, is that stories and experiences are two sides of the same coin. If you can give people a little bit of a story that describes the experience they're going to have, and then when they have that experience, they discover something that's meaningful to them. Oh my gosh, that's where the breakthroughs happen. If you can tell them a little give them a little bit of an experience and then ask them to share the story to somebody else in a way that they can understand it, they're going to have the teacher's epiphany and discover that there's something in it for them. So my suggestion for you is to never go 100% of the way with experience design. Stop at 90 and let people finish it themselves. Give them the pride of authorship and ownership and building because that's the moment when they bond to the idea and they become an advocate for it. That's truly where cults and support and all kinds of advocacy come from. It's when people make a discovery that's right for them and right for everybody else. Mike, thank you so much for such a great session today and answering all the questions. And thank you for watching. 
I hope that you will use today's learning to work on your current ideas, not only keeping the future in mind, but actually acting on it. If you want to see more events like this, make sure to register for the upcoming ones at expression.eventbrite.com or check the recordings we've got on this channel. With that, take care and I will see you around.